Hello, everyone. Uh, we're just going to give people a minute to trickle in, and then we will get started with this webinar on green banking. Thank you so much for coming tonight. Okay, that's enough time. Well, hello everyone. Thank you all so much for coming out tonight to learn more about green banking in the state of Massachusetts. We have some great panelists lined up, uh, so it's gonna be a really interesting time. My name is Kerry Katayan. I am the Massachusetts State Manager for Climate Exchange, and I am, oh, sorry. One note on captions is you can activate them yourselves uh, but we cannot activate them for everyone. Uh, you should be able to find the caption control at the bottom of this presentation. Anyway, my name is Kerry Katayan. I am the Massachusetts State Manager for Climate Exchange and the facilitator for Green Future Now. Green Future Now is a coalition of 42 environmentalists and community groups that all work together to make sure that Massachusetts is a leader in the fight against climate change. Uh, one programming note is Bert is not able to join us from the Connecticut Green Bank. Instead, we have Tom from the Montgomery Green Bank inst instead. Uh, another note is that please save your questions to the end. And when you do ask questions, please put them in the Q&A box and not the chat box. If they go in the chat box, they will not be read and they will not be asked. Uh, and with that, I'll pass it over to Abe to introduce himself. Great, well, thanks for that, Carrie, And thanks everybody for joining the webinar tonight. Um, my name is Abe Wapner. I'm a program director with the Coalition for Green Capital. Um, we're a nonprofit with offices in New York and DC that's been around about 10 years. and. We exist exclusively to advocate for, support, and help create new green banks across the country. Um, and we'll get into a little more detail on, on green banks and what they are when I have my time to talk, but um, great to, to be on the call with you all tonight. And Tom? Oh, hey, everybody. My name is Tom Dale. I'm the Chief Executive Officer of the Montgomery County Green Bank in Montgomery County, Maryland. And uh, I will try to channel Bert Hunter. Bert, Bert is uh, one of my board members, a founding chair of our board. So I know Bert well, we take his advice very much. So I'll try to bring my ideas to the table in the way that Bert might. So good to see you all. And John. Okay, hello everybody, I'm John Cleveland. I'm a strategic advisor to the Boston Green Ribbon Commission. Uh, the commission was established in 2010 and is a voluntary CEO network that's supporting the implementation of the city of Boston's climate action plan. Uh, our stakeholders are primarily representative of large property owners and large energy users in the city, uh, healthcare, higher education, commercial real estate, cultural institutions, um, et cetera. And we were very engaged with the city in the development and passage of its building emissions performance standard called BIRDO 2.0. And as part of that process and the conversations with the city, um, we agreed to partner with them on exploring the development of a climate bank that could support building owners in complying with the BIRDO 2.0. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about where that project is. Great. Um, yeah, so I guess we could start off with Abe and I guess Green Banks 101. What is a green bank and why do they matter? Great, sure. So at CGC, we like to define green banks as mission-driven institutions that uh, finance clean energy markets and try to bridge existing gaps. Um, so I can try to unpack that a little uh, when I say institutions, um, green banks are really built to be lasting partners in the markets where they operate. Um, they're not your typical um, clean energy revolving loan fund or a program that, you know, once the capital is deployed, they, um, they kind of wipe their hands and say, yes, we're done. Uh, a green bank exists to kind of figure out difficult areas of the market. Uh, develop solutions to solve those. Um, and then once those have been addressed, move on to the next part of the market. 
Um, so Tom will talk a little bit about all the great things that they're doing down in Montgomery County. Um, but as I'm sure he'll he'll get to, they're always trying to think of new and, and exciting ways to, to bridge gaps in clean energy markets. Um, so like I said, green banks are long-term institutions. They focus on clean energy. Um, Although some green banks have, have been bridging out into areas adjacent to that, such as resiliency, um, clean energy has been the real focus of the, the green bank. Um, the term bank can be a little confusing for some folks. Uh, green banks are not deposit holding institutions. They're not FDIC regulated um, and they come in a whole bunch of different structures. Um, so you'll see green banks that are public, quasi-public, independent nonprofits, um, so we like to, th to think that the real thing that holds all the green banks together um, is the fact that they're mission driven. Um, green banks share a common goal of, of increasing the amount of financing that flows into clean energy markets. Um, one thing that green banks do really well is they, they partner with existing actors in the market, specifically lenders. Um, green banks don't compete with existing lenders. They help support them through all kinds of different activities like credit enhancement, co-investment strategies, aggregation and securitization. Um, I imagine Tom will go into some of the specifics of those in, in um, detail, but um, I'm happy to walk through uh, any of the high level stuff if, if folks have questions at the end here. Um, but so green banks work with private lenders to try and bridge uh, those tough gaps in, in clean energy markets that prevent projects from getting across the line. And that can be in um, difficult to reach demographics like LMI communities. It can be difficulty with uh, project size um, if small scale projects are, are not getting attention from private lenders um, or can deal with a whole host of other issues like timing, regulation, uh, whatever the nuances of that specific geography might be, the Green Bank can help develop um, financing solutions to help uh, get projects completed by, by getting around those gaps using, using financing. Um, so Green Banks are really important and they uh, are able to kind of help clean energy markets develop all across the country. Um, we've seen the model be successful. Um, they're in uh, 16 different states. There's 22 green banks across the country at the state and local level. Um, and more, be can, more are being considered every day. Um, and we've seen it work not only in kind of the blue coastal states where you have a democratic legislature to put a billion dollars into their green bank like, like New York, um, but we've also seen um, you know, green bank legislation introduced in places like Nevada, Utah, Alaska, um, Illinois, places that are, uh, you know, less of your traditional um, blue coastal markets. So um, we think green banking is a, a really powerful tool that uh, can be applied across a, a wide, ra uh, wide range of, of geographies to help move clean energy markets forward. That's really interesting now. Uh, so I guess my follow up question is how common are green banks? and are more being considered? Yeah, absolutely. So um, like I said, there's about 22 green banks across the country today. Um, they're being considered in, um, I don't know the exact number, but a lot of different states. CGC works um, in one of our capacities to help stand up and advise on folks looking to do new green banks um, on everywhere from the state to the, the local level. Um, and one thing that's really promising is the potential for a, a national climate bank that was included in the reconciliation package. I think we'll know in the next couple of weeks whether or not that is truly dead. Uh, it seems to, to get new life every other week. Um, we're waiting to see what happens with Mansion and Cinema. Um, and if that moves forward, then we could potentially be looking at a $20 billion fund administered through the EPA that would support and fund the development of green banks all across the country. Um, and that would be very exciting for people like me at CGC who want to see this model deployed in all 50 states because um, we think it can, can really make a difference. So um, while there are, green banks have done about $9 billion of overall investment so far, um, that is just a drop in the bucket of what we need to be doing to you know, combat climate change. I think some of the, the UN estimates we need about a trillion dollars a year. Um, we're, we're, we're nowhere near that yet. So I think there's still a lot of work to be done um, and it's exciting to, to see new green banks potentially springing up um, all over the country. Yeah, that would definitely be amazing. Uh, so I guess my next couple of questions are for Tom. Uh, how did the Montgomery, we can start off with how did, how did the Montgomery uh, County Green Bank uh, get off the ground? 
Oh, you're muted. I'm trying to keep the background noise. If you're right, I'll pull up my presentation and can walk through that. I think I can answer your questions. Does that work for you? Yeah, sounds good. Cool. All right. All right. Is that working now? You got it? Yeah, it is working. Okay, cool. Um, so I'll walk through what the Montgomery County Green Bank is, how we got started and so forth, and maybe cover a little bit of ground. Um, 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 are you all hearing me okay? Yep. Okay, good. I get this little weird uh, thing that says I have to do some audio stuff and I don't want to fool with that. Um, but uh, to the point made about, you know, what is a green bank and we get confused. Um, so we were the Montgomery County Green Bank, Montgomery County, Maryland, and we have a tagline, your partner for clean energy, resulting from when we went to our uh, department, State Department of Licensing, they thought we were a bank and they were looking for the regulated nature of us. And we said, no, 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 we're a green bank. Um, and so they had to research what that was and they said, okay, we understand it, but you have to put a tagline so people don't think that they're coming to you as a depository. So our tagline has to be shown with our logo at all times, right? But that's the confusing part to try to educate people what green banks are. Um, but, you know, what, how do they fit in the market? What are they working with? <clears throat> Abe had talked about, you know, we're there to support clean energy investing and most people approach clean energy investing on the far left column. They got a project, they put their cash in, maybe they go out and they get some money from the pub public utilities, from incentives, and that covers it, right? And they look for a return on investment over the period of time by which they want that cash returned, which is generally a pretty short-term timetable. It's two, three years maybe, right? What we're trying to say is, look, you know, there is money to be made in those hills, right? That when you do energy efficiency, the first column on the left says you're paying 100% of your cost, you know, you know, your utility bill, um, inefficient systems, non-renewable energy, you introduce energy efficiency into what your current mix is, you introduce renewables, you reduce your, ex your external energy costs, you pull in some return from targeted energy savings, use that instead of your own capital, which you could probably deploy in a better way than just putting it into your own uh, HVAC systems, turn that into repayment on the financing, preserve your cash, use your cash for other investable opportunities. So that's where the green bank is sort of fitting in there. Uh, the problem with that structure is that most lenders don't understand that target energy savings. And so they don't understand that they can trust that that money exists, that they can then put it into financing. So that's where green banks actually come in because in that partnering that Abe had talked about is for our world to be the one that understands that and, and com give comfort to those that, that don't. And that's what this is sort of a green bank model, which is um, there are low carbon projects out there. There are private investors that want to invest in them, but they don't believe in them because they don't, they think they're too risky to take that. They want to take the property as a lien. They don't want to take the equipment as a lien. Therefore, it creates a whole jumble of problems for lenders to get involved. The green bank steps in as a partner with those private investors. It provides risk mitigation. I'll get into a little bit with some of those techniques as go so that, you know, we're not the direct investor. We partner with the investors. They put their money in. We put our money behind or with the investors and it creates a risk mitigation strategy. How does the green bank operate with, it doesn't need, we need more than air to operate. And that's where the government or other uh, investing comes in. They invest in the green bank. Um, that's a source of capital that comes into the green bank. Sometimes it can come from ratepayer funds. Sometimes it comes from other appropriated dollars, but that's the money the green bank uses. The reason government is comfortable in giving that to the green bank, because if we do our job right, we know the markets, we've created risk mitigation, we actually don't lose a whole lot of money and the government gets it back or says, oh, you've done such a good job, go ahead and recycle that. And they get a much more multiple out of their, their funding. And that's really the game of the green banks is to be a leverage game. We take a dollar, we turn it into $3 through our partnering or turn it into $7. And then we get that money back and we turn it again. So we get this multiplying effect. And that's what that's what you know government's looking for. That's what investors are looking for. And we get a multiple of projects going. 
So to the Montgomery County Green Bank, as Abe had said, we're, we're, we're mission driven. They're all mission driven. And, and generally they're all nonprofits or close to a quasi public, but they all have, you know, they're, they're not profit sharing. They're not, they're making, not making money to, to pay back investors, except for the government if they want their money back. Um, we were chartered in 2016. We, so the, the government created us, they gave us a charter. They said, this is what we want you to do. This is the where we want you to play. At the end of the day, though, you're independent of us. You're a 501c3 nonprofit. Go out and do your business. If you cause problems in the market, we're not calling you our baby. You go off and you're going to be a grown child and you're going to do what you're going to do. So we're not in the government, but we were created by the government so that at the end of the day, if, you know, they can take back whatever they give to us when if we ever were to sort of go out of business. That's kind of the relationship there. Um, our purpose is to accelerate investment in energy efficiency, renewable energy by partnering with the private sector. And I'll go into what partnering looks like. Uh, we have a broad mission, as, as, as Abe had talked about. It's not only about ad addressing clean energy and energy efficiency, about being diverse and equitable in that treatment. There's a lot of communities out there that get passed over with this type of investment. We've seen that historically. So our job is to be broad across that, make sure we have an inclusive approach. Um, as I mentioned, our job is to create more resources from the county than they give us. So we give us a dollar, we're to turn that into three to five dollars. And we do that by de-risking the private sector. Um, the county has large goals, 0% emissions by 2035. So our job is to help get there. Um, I think John's gonna talk about building energy performance standards. Those just got enacted here in the county. Uh, that's gonna be a great benefit. Up to now we've been operating in a marketplace where we didn't have that sort of regulatory driver there. Um, and that's gonna give us more world to work in because these properties are gonna to have to make changes versus being incentive to make those changes. Um, the other thing not on here is where do we get our money? That's always a question. You know, how did you get started, right? Well, so we got our money first from the county had funds that were provided to it because two, two utilities merged that created a resource, a settlement fund they used uh, initially 14 million, grew it to 18 million of, of capital that they gave to us at the Green Bank to use it to make our products work. And that was a single source of money. They delivered it uh, once and we've been using that. It is important to get operating dollars when that comes. We were able to use 15% of that to help support our operating budget. And then you build products and you begin to generate revenues that begins to offset your expenses. Um, and because we've become a proven model, and I'll walk through what that is, the county now has just appropriated $18 million this year to us as a second tranche of money because we've been able to show production, show improvements, um, and that's going to be uh, hopefully an annual investment in us. But it takes a bit. You have to show your bona fides, and then you get there. So how does a green bank actually use that money? So we have multiple ways we can partner. Um, and the idea is to create a mix of portfolio that we take a dollar and turn it into that three to five. So one of the simplest ways is on the left where we use 100% of other people's money. So we use 100% of lender money. They wanna put it in there, but they don't understand the risk. We say, fine, we'll stand behind the risk of that portfolio. You go ahead and originate loans. If those loans go bad, we'll make it up to you. And therefore, you bring your money in. Now that's good. They still have their own underwriting standards they work to. So there's a little less flexibility in there, but it does get other people's money effectively into the marketplace in a big way. The next way is to say, hey, let's sort of, you know, look at marrying a little bit of this. You know, we'll do a little bit of guaranteeing that product, but we'll also put some of our money into that deal. Um, and so we'll risk mitigate through, maybe you don't feel like you can take 100% of that project. All right, we'll take maybe 30% of that project. You take the other 70% and therefore, you know, we'll cover that base. Um, that's good, but it generally means that we're covering, you know, we're still working within their confines. When you move over a couple of columns, this is where we get into the high flexible nature. It's a higher risk project, rather uncomfortable nature for that lender, but they want to put something into it. We'll put a lot bigger slug of capital into it uh, in order for that project to move forward. Over time, that project gets um, um, shown that it actually does perform, and then you can move it off your balance sheet. You can sell your part of the capital, recapture it. But sometimes the project's just a little too risky for folks to take. So many different ways in which we've been able to operate from standing behind lenders to participating with lenders in a modest way to participating in a large way where we can bring a lot more flexibility into the project if it needs it. 
So at this point in time, this is where we've gotten. This didn't happen overnight. This happened over five years. You know, we started with the third line down there, the commercial loan for energy efficiency. It was a model we leveraged another green bank. That's the lovely thing about the green bank network. It's a great sharing network. You want to find something out, you talk to a partner, they'll tell you about it. You go to CGC, they'll bring you the ideas. You don't have to start from scratch. Learn from what other people have done. We certainly did that by learning from the Connecticut Green Bank as our, as our board member. But we started it out as a loan program to support commercial. It was a lost reserve. We put our money behind uh, the other lenders doing it. We thought we would do $50,000 loans. That's what the Michigan Saves that we borrowed the program from found they were doing. We haven't done anything less than 200,000 on it. It's doing a half a million, a million. So the other, I think Abe, you talked about this, right? You gotta know what's going on in your market. You gotta tailor your product to what's going on in the market. There was a whole series of working groups that went on of us talking to our constituents. And then the early stages when I started was going out talking to the contractors. What are your customers seeing? Where's the rub? Where's the need? And you begin to build your product suite around what you continue to learn. So we started with that. We introduced the top line one, which was a similar product that was for homeowners to do energy efficiency, renewable energy. Then we saw the marketplace needed more flexibility. So we created a small business energy savings program, launched it at the beginning of COVID, feeling that businesses were going to need investment. That's where we put a lot more of our capital into it. We did it with a community bank, a community development financial institution that could do more unregulated lending. We've done a ton of deals in that. Then we've launched a commercial solar power purchase agreement because we found there were a lot of nonprofits and faith-based and others who wanted to do no out-of-pocket lending. We did that. We're investing in the developer who brings that. And then we've done a community solar project in which we, you know, we provided our funds into the community solar. So with each one of these, we kind of learned from where the market was wanting us to be and we found ways to construct it. This is a sample deal. This was done with two products, our commercial loan product, plus our own financing. It was a condominium property, a high rise, 212 units. They had an energy efficiency project that they've been working on for years to try to get doing, done. It was, they needed to change over some inefficient boilers and, and heating systems. Um, we worked with our partner lender on it. It was a one and a half million dollar project. The lender felt comfortable at 837,000. So we backed that loan so they could do that. There was still a gap. We put in 200,000 of our own capital into a bridge loan in order for them to sort of get more, get the capital they needed to do it. They got about $100,000 of incentives from the utilities, and then they had to put a little bit of their own capital from their capital plan. But that got the project done. They've been trying to get this done for five years. We got it done within a year after starting to talk with them. This is what we've gotten done to date. Uh, you know, we're about, about $10 million of project financed. 1,000 metric tons of avoided energy ga greenhouse gas emissions. That's what's no longer being generated because of the improvements done. Uh, we supported about 750 households. That's both in the, in the home ownership and rental. You know, more than two thirds of those are low moderate income households and about 450 are multifamily. And through this, we don't, we don't go out and count head counts of jobs, but using a rubric of about, you know, about one job per $100,000 of investment, we've supported basically 100 FTE jobs through our, through our investment. And there's the last slide to just point out, give yourself time. It takes time to build an enterprise. You're, it's a startup. Every time these launch, they're a startup. You've got to build the products, you know, get some initial products. You got to build awareness. A lot of the time spent in the first two years was just talking to parties, making sure they wear the green bank. It's not an idea that doesn't it doesn't resonate. People understand it, but they don't get it. As soon as you get the first deal done, <laughs> the next one comes, right? People say, aha, got that. I understand what you can do now. Now we get a couple more done and then more parties join the fund. And then just this last year, we finally sort of went through it. And part of that was also bringing on more people. We did it small, we grew, but as you bring more people and they can communicate, you get more education. But you needed the deals first in order to draw the education. So. It's a hockey stick. Every green bank, if you ever looked at their production, that's the exact same graph you'll find from every green bank that's out there. So I think that's the end of my presentation. Yeah, John, that's absolutely amazing work you're doing down, down there in Maryland. Uh, but now we get to the fun part where we get to talk about Massachusetts. Uh, so John, can you tell me about the current efforts to create a green bank in the Commonwealth? 
Yeah, we just want to do what Tom just described that they did. <laughs> so, I mean, a really simple way of putting it. But let me give you a little background in terms of um, where the project came from and where we are in the process. So um, it really started about three years ago. Uh, Boston was part of the Bloomberg American City Climate Challenge. And through that process, they got funding and technical support from NRDC and a couple other players, Vivid Economics was one of the consultants, Firefly was another, to look at the design for a Boston climate bank. So initially this was focused just on the city of Boston. And under that program, they did a lot of great background analysis. They worked with Abe and his organization to understand generally how green banks are structured, what the varieties of organizational design are. Uh, they looked at some of the financial models. They actually did a deep, you know, a little deeper market scan um, in affordable housing. So sort of created a context so that wasn't really, um, you know, wasn't, wasn't necessarily, a, you know, a brand new thing. Um, and then the way this particular project um, got started is the Green Ribbon Commission was post our strategic plan process and our engagement with the city on the emissions performance um, standard, trying to think about how can we support the city in its um, what we call Birdo 2.0, um, implementation. And in the conversation with the city, basically the city, city leadership said, you know, we need to take that nice work that we did under the American cities, the ACCC, and we need to turn it into an actual business plan and a launch strategy for a bank. So um, we went out and um, uh, raised capital to do a business plan um, uh, through the generosity of the Bank of America Foundation. We got a, a quarter million dollar grant to do that, put a project team together and started working um, on the design of a Boston Climate Bank. Um, but in the process, we brought in our partners from the Mass Clean Energy Center, um, uh, Gayla Nelson and Peter McPhee that many of you, and Kelsey Reed now that many of you know. Um, and turns out that they had been charged by Undersecretary Chang um, to look at the feasibility of a Commonwealth Climate Bank. So um, we ended up just merging our efforts. They put some uh, resources into the business planning process and we've been doing it as a joint exercise with the um, acknowledged preference at the front end to have the institution be a statewide institution and not a city institution. And we talked to many of the other um, the folks in Abe's network and they all said, if you can do this at the state level, start at the state level, you know, that's the way you should do it. Now, somebody like New York and the, and I seek the New York City Energy Efficiency Corporation, they actually started in the city and emerged out and are now more of a regional institution. Um, uh, but since uh, Mass CEC had this mandate, um, we agreed that's the way we would, that's the way we'd focus. Um, we ended up uh, hiring a set of consultants um, uh, with deep experience, particularly in the New York uh, bank. Um, one of them had been the startup CEO. Um, and the second person, Jessica Wigley, had been the um, first hire of the New York City Bank and then their uh, financial advisors, the 4th Street Street Advisors. So we have a, a team that's not only really worked on a deep implementation of a climate bank, but also is really familiar and has done consulting with a bunch of the other uh, banks. So uh, we have a sort of a three phase uh, business planning process. Phase one was completed in June, and that was really looking at all the existing work that had been done, doing interviews with folks in the market, doing the market scan and sort of setting up what the basic um, framework for the bank might be. The second phase that we're in the middle of now that should get completed um, in August is actually, um, actually articulating what the product line would be, similar to what Tom was laying out at the end of his presentation. Um, and then uh, what organizational design options um, would look like and um, what the sort of thinking about a startup would be. And then the last phase will actually, which should be completed, the plan right now is to be completed in November, will be a full business plan um, with a capitalization strategy um, and staffing and a startup um, strategy. Now, as those of you who are on the call who sort of know the Massachusetts market for this, I think um, there have been two big motivations to really get this work going and get a, you know, be prepared for opportunities that might show up. Um, one of them, of course, was we were hoping there would be a big tranche of federal, you know, money um, in the, you know, out, out of the build back better. It didn't happen. 
but um, we basically wanted our bucket ready <laughs> to receive federal funding if it was there. Um, it didn't happen. It's as, as uh, Abe said, it still might. It still might happen. It's not all over yet. Um, but a big motivation has been the emergence of um, the, the um, both implementation and long-term need for policy mandates that basically require building owners to reduce their emissions. Um, Boston has an ordinance. Cambridge is working on an ordinance. The Clean Energy and Draft Clean Energy and Climate Plan that just came out has in it uh, a potential design for a clean heat standard that would be statewide uh, in nature. We have the Clean Heat Commission that's actually working on those aspects of it. And the Clean Energy and Climate Plan, the CECP as it's called, um, actually calls out the need for both a combination of financing tools and technical assistance for building owners to support compliance with the emerging mandates. So that's a, you know, that's a, a big motivation um, and, uh, and we want it to be ready and to be in place. Um, I, I do want to, um, before, before closing it up, the comments, I do want to reiterate a couple of things that I think both Tom and, and Abe said. A climate bank is not a silver bullet. You know, it does not solve all problems. A climate bank can facilitate financing. It can't solve what's basically a subsidy gap. Um, and, uh, and, and one of the big subsidy gaps that is emerging in the market is in the policy mandates and the shift from a focus on energy efficiency to greenhouse gas emissions reductions, which in many cases involves electrification, you don't have the same return on investment criteria that you would normally use to justify an investment by the private owner. Now, if you have a policy mandate like Boston does, and you basically pay $235 a ton for carbon, if you don't meet the standards, then you do have an actual financial standard to re-engineer how you do the ROI. Um, but as an example, that's not anything banks have thought about now. They don't have underwriting standards that would take into account the fact that you're avoiding future alternative compliance payments. So that's one aspect of it that we really um, need to think about and need to, and need to work on. And then um, second, as I think as Tom was really laying out, it really takes time to build the capacity of these institutions. And you can't actually really know what the ideal product portfolio for a bank is until you go out in the market and talk to your customers and start doing transactions and be able to see what works and what doesn't work. So while, um, while the business plan will in fact craft hypotheses about what the right kinds of, of um, a financing gap tools will be, we really won't know until we, uh, until we go out into the marketplace. And the last thing just to emphasize is to get these things started, it takes patient public funding. Um, you, you really can't engage your private finance players. And we have a steering committee that includes um, several private finance players. You can't engage them until you're out there and you have some credibility. Um, and they know that you're reliable. They know you're gonna be around. So at the front end, it takes public investment both for the startup cost, just the operating cost, and for the startup investment capital. So um, we want to be ready for opportunities that uh, that might show up, and we want we figure if we have a really good business plan and a really good design, people are confident um, uh, that something that the idea has been thought through. It will increase the odds that the legislature or a future governor will say, "Yes, I'm ready to go, ready to commit to public capital." So that's where we're at. Great. And then I guess one final question I have is, so are we most like, what's the most likely way we would see a green bank created in Massachusetts? Could this be done by our next governor or would it require the legislature to pass a bill? Um, as I understand it, and, and Abe and, and, uh, and Tom might, might add more to it, there's nothing in the startup of a of a climate bank that requires um, legislative authority. You don't need legislative authorization to do it. If you're gonna be using um, public state money, you need an appropriation. You need a designated appropriation, um, but it's also entirely possible that a future governor could, could take resources out of existing appropriation funds um, and use it. Um, there is, we understand that there is 
a lot of interest in the legislature, um, Carrie, and the, and the folks who in fact are working on the current climate bill. There's a lot of interest in the idea of a climate bank. I don't believe there has yet been a specific amendment or specific legislation um, proposed, but um, uh, certainly at least one of the future gubernatorial candidates has included this in, you know, in her policy package and her, you know, her climate policy package. So um, uh, we suspect that there will be gubernatorial support at some point in time, but I do wanna emphasize, we don't currently have an obvious identified source of startup capital for a climate bank. Okay, so it's interesting. You don't need to have, you just need the legislature mostly as a source of revenue, not as a- it, yeah, these, these are typically either independent uh, entities as the Montgomery Bank is a 501c or they're, or they're you know, quasi-independent um, entities. So, um, you, you, you know, it would also depend on, again, if it's a commonwealth level thing, where is the launch of the bank? How? What entity is it? You know, and, and how does it interact with other players like mass development? You know, for instance, who are or in mass saves who are involved in um, financing of one kind or another. You know, that's a whole that's part of the organizational design options um, that are getting worked on that haven't um, been um, completed yet. But I, I do want to the, the the leverage point that Tom laid out. Um, the climate impact advising consulting team that's done some analysis, and the leverage on the existing banks that have been in the market for a while is anywhere in the six to 10 X. So, you know, you put in 50 million and you can get um, 500 million in leveraged capital. So that's generally a pretty, a pretty, um, you know, a pretty decent, a decent leverage. So it just, it's hard to see how in Massachusetts, given the policy mandates that are in place and coming down the pipe, it wouldn't make sense to have a climate bank. I mean, it's, you know, mm. I don't wanna say it's a total no brainer, but it's really, it really would make sense to do that. And then I think, you know, the other thing you need to think about is what's the relationship with the people who do the financing versus the people who do the technical assistance and get the customers ready to actually approach it, you know, approach a, a financing entity. In many cases, it's the financing entity that does it. But you know, New York also has the retrofit accelerator. And so we need to think about what the technical assistance capacity is that goes along with the financing capacity. And both of those are spoken to in the clean energy and climate plan. So Carrie, if I, just to the point about the, the structure piece, um, there are a few, not, a few green banks out there that are strictly nonprofits formed on their own generally smaller types, sort of single focused green banks. They don't generally, because partly is they've got to go out and raise their own capital. Um, and, you know, government can fund them, but generally government funding independent nonprofits comes in small numbers, not a lot of zeros on it. And so that makes it a little bit difficult to amass the capital. Um, the, the, one, the, the green banks that are somewhat more chartered by their local government or state government um, generally have a little bit more uh, stamp of approval. You, you wanna not get too close to that though because the strength of the green bank is that the private lending market thinks it's operating with a independent entity that can make its own financial decisions and not think it's having to work through a state or, or local government bureaucracy to get that decision. And so that's the beauty and what's come to be great here in Montgomery County is there's this understanding between the two that they can give us money but not know that they're having to put it on their books. We kind of operate, we can be flexible. So there's strength in being connected, but not inside would be my sort of sense, right? Uh, Connecticut Green Bank is kind of quasi-public and, and they can operate in that way, a little bit closer to state than we are, which is at the local government level. But there is, an, there is a nice strength in that relationship between the two, both from a monetary one and, from, and a separation from a banking one. Yeah, absolutely. And just to build off of that, I think when we're thinking about where to start new green banks in states, We'll often try to partner with uh, like more nimble actors. If you don't want to go forward with legislation, partnering with the energy office, partnering with the governor's office, someone that can kind of mandate the creation of something, get a lot of political energy. But if there's not going to be an allocation from the legislature, the process of getting a bill through can often be like yeah. a really onerous one. And so it often makes more sense to 
like Tom's saying, incorporate something a little more nimble, like a nonprofit. Um, uh, an example of this is in, in Colorado, where we worked with the state's energy office to create a nonprofit um, that was you know, adjacent to government. It had um, a lot of board representation from members of the state. Um, and then the governor um, wrote into his budget a $30 million allocation for the fund hmm. um, to act as the state's green bank. And so that was kind of the roundabout way that it went. But the, the only legislation was the budget bill that actually passed allocating money to the green bank that already existed. Yeah, that's good to know. I definitely know most of the audience uh, is aware of the difficulties of working with a state legislature. Um, Great. With that, that is all the pre-planned questions I had ready. So we still have about 19 minutes before eight o'clock. If it's all right with our panelists, I'll ask some questions from the audience. Uh, I do just also want to say there's quite a few questions from the audience, so we will not be able to get them to them all tonight. Um, so one of them is from Dory. I live in a small town in New Hampshire. Could we start a green bank or or larger municipalities better suited to supporting a green bank? I can take a, a first stab at this one. I think it's a, it's a question of scale is what we're thinking about the most time. And it's often very hard in smaller municipalities to get the deal flow that you would need to sustain the operations of a green bank. Like Tom was saying, an important part of operations is having like very patient operating capital that can get you through that kind of flatter end of the hockey stick before you start making deals. But you know, even if you're getting a, a high percentage of the market penetrated in a, in a very small town, it might not be enough to sustain even just the salaries of a couple folks to run your green bank. Um, so we often try to think that like at the state level, Montgomery County is a great model. You know, like they started with around you know 12, 14 million dollars, and that's a that's a pretty sweet spot. And um, for the state, we like to say that nothing like about around 30 to 50 million is kind of what you need to to sustain the operations of a full time staff. Yeah, and it's it's okay. scale both from supporting operations. It's also scale in attracting your investor partners. If they don't find that there's enough production there, it's hard to attract them into your market and get any benefits off of that. Right, you're you're trying to attract them, generate some interest on their part, so they'll they'll come in. And so we're a million people in Montgomery County, right? We're a pretty sizable county with with a pretty large corporate and and you know real estate base. But so so your partners need to see scale too. Okay. Well, I guess speaking of scale, uh, Sherry Morgan has a question. Um, what is the estimated amount of funds, of uh, public funds needed to start a green bank in Massachusetts? I, I, I would say that, you know, the, the advice from the consultants who have been working with us, Carrie, have been, um, you know, you really need a minimum of is something in the 15 to 20 million dollar range but if you're doing a state level bank just as abe just said abe and tom just said you know you really should be looking at the 40 to 50 million dollar range if you you know if you want enough resources to get real staff up and going and you wanted enough um uh, lending capital to really stimulate the market it really ought to be something in in that scale okay uh, and then one question from the audience that I can answer is, will we have access to a recording of this webinar? And the answer is yes. You should get an email about that tomorrow. So if you can make it or you can attend the whole thing, you will be able to see the whole thing. Um, just, Carrie, I can share my PowerPoint with you too, if you want to distribute, that's fine too. Oh yes, that would be great. Um, so I'm just trying to find questions that we haven't indirectly answered before this. Um, so Stephen Warner asks, can you clarify what a public private structure, what the options for those are? Is that is that from an investing side? I assume maybe maybe I think it's I, I get the sense it's probably for someone who's a little uh you know how exactly does a public private partnership normally work for those of us who do not run uh financial institutions yeah. as a base? So 
so from an from an investing standpoint, yeah. um, it would you know we we enter into agreements with the financial partners, which which describe the relationship between what they'll do, what they'll invest in, what their underwriting will look like, and then what we will do in terms of providing resources to cover the risk in that, how they can claim those resources, how we would pay them in. So that's kind of a a simple approach to public private and you know they're the i guess if you put us in the public side which i guess we are in that we're chartered that way but we're we're even a private nonprofit but that's kind of what you end up doing is finding what is the relationships you're trying to construct and then build the legal agreements between those um, you know it could be a loss reserve agreement it could be a participation agreement which they say okay they're going to originate the loan we're going to buy a piece of that what does that agreement say in terms of how much we're buying? What's our rate we're going to buy? What happens if the loan goes bad? What's the, what's the proceeds? So it's built. So you find, you're first trying to find your commonalities. What are you trying to accomplish? What role do you want to take? What role do we want to take? And then find the vehicle for you know putting that into a, a legal relationship. And, and those, I think it's just important to emphasize those, again, those things don't happen overnight. You know, particularly if you're doing a, you know, you might think about it as a sort of a wholesale platform like that, where you're setting up a structure where it's relatively easy for your partners to access it, as opposed to doing deal by deal, do you know, detailed due diligence. It takes a the the nice the New York folks described in excruciating detail how long it took them to get the design right, to get the partners to understand it, and to get the partners to trust that it was a good deal for them to transact with. And this is a lot of the work of being out in the market and getting the customers to know you so that in fact, they do then, in fact, when they, they know how to come to you and how to use your resources. It just, it takes time. It does not happen overnight. Thanks, John. I forgot about that effort, but yeah, you're absolutely right. And getting the first partner to join in with you is probably part of the hardest part. And then once the other partners begin to see, see deals getting done, then they begin to say, oh, maybe there's a piece of that pie I would like too, right? But it, you got to get the first convincing partner over the transom, and then you can start to build out. But yeah, you're absolutely right about that. You got to build that, that path. Okay. And then um, Sherry Morgan also asks, are there green banks in other countries? Yeah, so there's... um. The, the world's largest green bank is actually in Australia. They've done, I think, over $10 billion of investment on their own, the Clean Energy Financing Corporation. Uh, but there's a, there, there are green banks in a number of other international countries. The UK's Green Investment Bank was actually the first green bank, which is why we call them all green banks, because they started that term as the Green Investment Bank. It was set up as a, a public um, investment vehicle, and they basically kickstarted the offshore wind market in um, the UK by, like, sweetening the deal so that pension funds and other institutional investors would start investing in these massive offshore wind projects. Um, and they were so good at that, that they ended up getting, getting bought by Macquarie um, and became a private investment arm of that company. So, um, but there are other green banks in places like Japan, Malaysia, South Africa, Rwanda. Um, so it's a model that, that doesn't just work in the US and actually has been, if you look at the numbers, more successful outside of the US um, than it is here. It's kind of wild to think that we, we don't have a, a national climate bank given the success of the model um, in the States and out, outside of it. Mm. Yeah. I, um, so Dory asks, do you have any green banks partner with investors outside of the state? Is that a common thing? Um, so it's less common. Um, there are green banks like Inclusive Prosperity Capital, which is a nonprofit green bank with a national footprint that offers their products um, out, across state lines. They spawn out of the Connecticut Green Bank with some of the more successful products like the Smart E Loan, um, which is a, a loan loss reserve for energy efficiency, solar residential improvements. Um, but generally, green banks are focused on that specific geography in which they reside and kind of being that like, like Tom was saying, the expert in the market that really understands all the nuance there that can work with the local partners to kind of grease the gears and, and make deals work. 
Yeah, I think you had a politician that once said all politics is local. Um, it's the same with real estate and energy efficiency because different public utilities, different rate structures, different product, different ways that buildings are built, that you have to find what it is in your market that is necessary and where the rub is and you know what how, how educated the contractors are. What are your kind? So there is at some point it has to come down into the market you're working in and make sure that your product is tailored for the, the demand that's coming out of it. So. Yeah, I would, the, the only thing I would add to that, Carrie, is that you know the other uh, potential, the other value of a of a climate bank or a green bank is that by being out in the market, it really understands what the barriers to transaction and implementation are that can inform public policy as public policy yeah. evolves. You know, so if you're in the, you know, the like Tom and his peers are. You know, in the you know in the trenches doing the individual deals, you then end up developing insights about what kinds of policy incentives or policy mandates are actually going to influence behavior, and you're going to have theories about it that are just fundamentally wrong. Um, and so it's a you can also think about it as a market research mechanism and a market probing mechanism as well as just a finance me mechanism that I think um, uh, you know, has an important value to policymakers. John, that's a great point. And you know, we've run some technical assistance on our own dime for a number of properties to sort of help the properties understand what it is that they're facing, how it is that they can set a plan in place to make the improvements, how do they finance that, where are the dollars that are the incentives that they can cover. And that was a great educational tool we're advancing it now with this new resource. In part, you had mentioned the, you know, the electrification issue, right? And that does loom as a big uh, item out there. How do you move off of fossil fuels, especially for a lot of the affordable properties, the rental properties, and so forth? Here, you know, you know, that's a big leap for them to go from maybe a central fossil fuel system to an electrification one. It's a big numbers gap that doesn't exist, and so part of our effort will also be to do that technical assistance to kind of identify what's that gap, how do you bridge that gap, and feed that back into the policy making apparatus here. So it's a great point, John. It's great. Huh. I hadn't thought of that. That's re really quite interesting. Uh, so John Brown has the question, uh, what are the details on Montgomery County's goal to be zero emissions by 2035? Because that does sound quite ambitious. <laughs> hugely ambitious and I invite you to go out to the Montgomery County Maryland site and go to the Department of Environmental Protection and look up the county's climate action plan that just got released about a year ago. They spent about 18 months working with a consultant and the community to come up with what were the, the, the strategies to achieve that from you know from the building side on the transportation side on water conservation was you know and there's a big, strong equity overlay on that in terms of how do they need to do this, not in just a blow it through way, but how to do it in a way that's equitable across the markets. So it lays out the game plan. I think when you look at that, you'll also see where are the resources they see to approach these. And the Green Bank is identified in many instances of this, as well as other resources. But uh, so they've laid out their strategy moving in that direction they're implementing different policies the building energy performance standards that they just passed was a key pivotal one for that they needed to move on to move since buildings were 60 percent of the gas uh, greenhouse gas emissions here that needed to be addressed so there's a there's a strong plan and they're 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 moving through the the, the elements of it uh and beginning to implement them but it's a bit it's a big task it's 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 they gotta they gotta move in, in big leaps to get there hmm and, and, you know, uh, Gary, the other thing, maybe, Abe, you could answer, you know, affirm if this is true or not. But generally, I think if you look at the way green banks are structured and the kinds of transactions they do, they, they sort of start in the small to medium sized enterprise market and go up, typically don't go up into the very large enterprises because they have their own financing. So in the commercial area, you know, they're not going to be working on a class A you know, office building, because most of those developers have their own access to capital, but it doesn't typically get down into the single family residential sort of edge of the market because the transaction costs are too high on a per dollar, you know, kind of basis. So we do have to remember that even 
let's say we had a really, really robust climate bank, you know, in Massachusetts, there's a chunk of the market for which it does not in fact solve the financing problem. And we probably need other instruments to be able to do that. So I think we should just, you know, remember that from a positioning point of view. I don't know, Abe, are there green banks that are, are, are deeply into the single family residential market or not? Yeah, there are, but I think you're making a really good point, which is that like, you need to think about your priorities and, and the fact that, like you said earlier, a green bank really can't bridge a subsidy gap if there's a problem with the project costs. Um, for example, the Connecticut Green Bank's been really successful at doing residential solar installations, but that's in large part because they have a per kilowatt hour incentive that they manage on behalf of the state. So it's because of the subsidy programs that they've been able to work in certain markets. Um, and like you said, transaction cost is a, is a big issue. It's, it's one that green banks can definitely help with. Um, like in the case of Colorado, where they're focused on the like, what's called the sub pace space, um, which are, are C pace projects that are below $250,000 that often don't get the attention from national investors because of the transaction cost. Like you said, it can be um, exclusionary for them. Just, they just, they make the same amount of money doing a $5 million project as they do a quarter million dollar project. So they don't really touch the ones that are less than a quarter. Um, and so a green bank can come in and be that dedicated lender for a small portion of the market, aggregate those deals, and then, you know, sell the paper up to the private lender once they've got a certain, you know, scale. But um, I think you're very right that, like, when you're planning a new green bank, you need to be cautious about the size of projects and be very realistic about what the green bank can and cannot do. Um, because without some of those things, like the state subsidies, you're not going to be able to, to penetrate every single market. And I, I don't know what the Massachusetts rates are, but, you know, Connecticut, as you said, 28 cents per kilowatt hour drives interest in energy efficiency, because that's a that's a big chunk of change to save if you bring any type of efficiency. And we're, we're at about 14 cents now, we were at 12. That's sort of on the edge of the economic sense of projects and homeowners and commercial businesses can maybe get a little bit there. I think we're all seeing, you know, I hate to, you know, put people on the call here. Energy prices are, I think we sense are just going to go up now, right? There's a lot of pressure on the, you know, the energy is still driven a lot by fossil fuel related, uh, you know, energy production and even renewables are costing more just because of the, you know, the, the um, supply chain problems. But I think you're going to see energy prices have been held constant in Maryland. A lot of it was because natural gas was so low, but I think we're going to see that moving up. And as that moves up, greater demand is going to be on looking for energy efficiency. And we can, and the green banks are going to be well positioned to fall right into that because we have low cost of capital. Lenders have higher cost of capital. We can drive benefits uh, by, by fitting right into that. Luck is when preparation meets opportunity, right? <laughs> Very good. Hello. We can, we can hear you, Carrie. Go ahead and speak. Okay. Hi. Sorry about that. I guess my Wi-Fi decided to misbehave right at the end because, of course, it had to. But with that, we are actually out of time. I would like to thank all of you for coming tonight and wanting to learn more about green banks and what they can do for Massachusetts. And I would like to thank the panelists for getting for being willing to spend their lovely evening, or at least it's lovely in Massachusetts, um, talking to us about green banks and what they can do. It's been absolutely great talking to you to, yeah, I'm sorry. It's been absolutely great talking to you all tonight. Great. Thanks so much, Carrie. Thank you, yep. Carrie. Thanks. Been great. Uh, right. Take care. Thank mm -hmm. you.